mental state uh, I'm really yesterday morning really kind of brought together a number of strands for us and I think it opened up maybe even the Pandora's box of other strands I'm going to say a few different kinds of reflections and I think you'll see them going um, so I'll just first of all go through the three um, Galen's talk to begin with um, I just want to highlight a couple things that she said that really struck me uh, she said and argue that language is full of psychology. And I think that's a theme that has come up again and again throughout this conference is the power and the magic of words because words can connect to not just our cerebral cortex in a sense, not just to our deliberate analytical mind, but they can touch us in the deepest, deepest parts of our heart and deep into the unconscious and can cut in all kinds of ways that we don't necessarily expect. Um, I'm particularly interested in my own work on the connotative meaning of language, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow <coughs> in relation to climate change. Um, she also talked a bit about the power of metaphor and images and how they reside in the unconscious and how we can be driven by those metaphors and images without even recognizing them. And I think that's really an incredible insight, obviously, of depth psychology. And that, unfortunately, that same knowledge is even now being used in the marketing and PR world. Um, we don't even know we're being manipulated in some ways by these forces. Uh, and one last comment about that is that Jeff asked, I thought, a wonderful question towards the end of that. He asked, what are the images we need today to convey the messages we need today? We looked at those wonderful paintings from the Renaissance and there are some of those kind of Western Christian archetypes of vices and virtues, but I don't know that they speak to this time, this kind of postmodern MTV era, um, very well. And so it's a great question. What are the images for us? Um, <coughs> then I want to turn to Dennis's talk, and in particular, Dennis's dream, which just, I, I absolutely love that. Um, mostly because it was so simple. There was nothing sublime. It wasn't thundering waterfall. It wasn't the giant, the precipice. It wasn't this crashing ocean. It was a meadow uh, in a, on a farm. And having grown up on a farm, I, I also identify with that up in the upper Midwest. But especially his description of how, what was special about it was that luminous, numinous quality, how every single atom and molecule glowed with an inner light in that dream. Um, I mean, I've had, I've been fortunate enough to have dreams that had that same kind of golden suffusion uh, uh, glow to them. And it strikes me there's a really interesting parallel, and I'm sorry he's not here right now, with David's presentation. Somebody used the word <laughs> incantation. And I think that's about right. It's an, David has the power to invoke a trance in an audience and to give us, to jolt us, just <coughs> for a moment perhaps, out of our kind of mundane, workaday world to remember what it's like to really touch the body of the earth, to breathe in the air, and so on. <clears throat> and so I think in some ways, listening to David, and I've done it for several years now, uh, I always find that he brings me into this kind of trance-like state that's kind of analogous to the dream experience. It's an unfamiliar, unfortunately, numinous way of perceiving reality. Yet we live in waking reality, where we have to acquire food, raise our families, work, etc. And so a question emerges for me out of this is, how do we bring these traces of the incantation, the trance, the dream, back into everyday life? How do we find ways to remember and not live there? I mean, I don't know that I would want to live in that kind of numinous quality all the time be hard to get things done. Um, but how do we bring those traces back and let them inform us, even if it's on the unconscious level? Another thing that he said that I, I just love this metaphor, mythological motifs, religious practices, and poetry, he said, are like powerful magnets. And let your conscience be like iron filings to be drawn to and reoriented that narratives and myths and stories not only pull us in because we recognize something about that provides order and structure to the kind of 
jumble of feelings that we may be having at the moment. So we find something that pulls us into that, into that story. But then once we hear that story, it actually reorients us. Just like the iron filings, the, the positive and the negative poles are reoriented to match the magnet. I love that idea that you are transformed through the story. Um, and then David's talk. I mean, I've already mentioned this before, and so I'm, I won't say a lot more about that. But this gets me to one of the things that I think is missing. Um, or has been missing. And it, it comes up in small traces once in a while, but I want to bring it back in in a direct way. And that is to remind ourselves that science itself, okay, the thing we've been in some ways and quite uh, reasonably critical of, itself can bring incredible meaning to the world. And that science itself is an incredibly creative and imaginative act itself. I mean, the imaginative leap of plate tectonics, I mean, it's an incredible leap. Or Einstein's general theory of relativity, I mean, that was a daydream. Or the famous dream of, was it cool, the, the one, the chemist who discovered benzene, he had a literal dream of snakes eating themselves and realized, well, upon waking, that was the structure of the benzene molecule. Of the benzene molecule. Um, so science, absolutely is a creative endeavor. But more than that, the findings of science, I think, have that same kind of power to awaken that incredible sense of wonder and connectedness to the world. I mean, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the oxygen cycle, they flow through us, and they connect us to every other living being and to the Earth itself. Um, I mean, just as an example, we're not only just exchanging ideas right now. But we're literally exchanging pieces of our bodies. I mean, science tells us that, you know, what we all contain a thousand atoms that were once in the bodies of Jesus Christ and Attila the Hun and Adolf Hitler and Mother Teresa and the squirrel that lived two million years ago and the dinosaurs that lived 65 million years ago. I mean, right here, right now, we have those in us, and we're actually sharing pieces of our bodies right now. Every time I breathe in, I'm breathing in pieces of John Katzenberg. And every time I breathe out, you're getting a little piece of my spleen. Somebody else is getting a part of my big toe. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, but that's a process that's actually happening right in front of us. And that we would only know through science. The realization that we are 98.9% .9 genetically identical to chimpanzees and share large proportions of our genes with every other living creature, animal, plant, fish, and insect. How does that not connect us back to the world? That's a radical concept. That all the heavy elements comprising our body were forged, as Sagan told us, in the heart of stars that exploded and spread their traces throughout space to slowly accumulate in this earthly body out of which we emerged. While others ask, how can we get people to truly understand the threats we collectively face? And I've noticed, that as an observer, the occasional stereotype, caricature, creep into our conversation. Scientists, science and scientists is devoid of anything but detached abstraction. Business is purely about greed. Politicians is completely corrupt the public as, in, as ignorant and in denial. And it seems to me that this way of speaking, and we all recognize the power of, and precision of words, this way of speaking glosses over the tremendous diversity of personalities, perspectives, and positions within each of these communities. They are all far more complex than these simple caricatures. <clears throat> I pleaded before for metaphorical pluralism, and I guess now I'm pleading for perceptual pluralism that each of these is a different, unique, and invaluable way of knowing. These aren't either ors because ultimately we need them all. And this brought me back to uh, a quote by Carl Jung. He said, in my picture of the world, <clears throat> there is a vast outer realm and an equally vast inner realm. And between these two stands man, facing now one and now the other. And according to his mood or disposition, taking the one for the absolute truth by denying or sacrificing the other. Okay. I think science needs to take responsibility for its intellectual origins and legacy. 
But the science of today is not the same science that Descartes and Bacon and Vesalius. We need to reconnect with our deepest internal drives, images, stories, and myths, but not at the same time become lost in endless navel-gazing. We need to reawaken our central engagement with the world, but the senses alone cannot tell us about global environmental change or the invisible and tasteless toxins and endocrine disruptors that flow through our bodies and waterways. I guess I feel like everyone else here that I'm struggling to reconcile to integrate these disparate voices into some kind of a harmony. And I feel it particularly because I am or have been a member of each of these different communities. I'm trained as a scientist. I've had incredibly powerful and intimate relations with particular places. I spent years doing union inspired dream work. I've been steeped in the ideas and in arguments of environmental history and philosophy. And I've worked in both politics and business. Uh, all of these conflicting perspectives and narratives coexist sometimes quite uneasily within me, and which is why it has been so provocative and so rewarding to listen and learn from you all. But at the same time, I'm reminded of this quote by the poet Ernesto Sabado. He said, in relation to learning, he said, we come out of ignorance and arrive once again to ignorance, but to an ignorance more rich, more complete, made up of tiny and infinite wisdoms. OK, and so I'd like to end with my personal story. We've been sharing our personal stories. And so I've been wondering what was the right one, and I finally realized that this is probably the one that, for me, somehow, some weird way ties together a lot of these disparate elements. Um, as many of you know, I used to work here. Um, I spent four years here in the early 1990s as a staff member of the Aspen Global Change Institute. Uh, an incredible experience learning about global environmental change and in particular global climate change from many of the world's leading scientists. And it was an incredible education. But it was pretty abstract. At the global level, technical language, communicated in figures, charts, numbers, yet intellectually mind-blowing. I mean, really, just, wow, look at what we've done. But at the same time, I had a parallel life, separate life, in which I was developing a really deep and intimate love affair with the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And I love this landscape. Four distinct seasons, champagne, powder, snow, clouds that are crisp, and the edges and the thunderstorms that come up the valley and rock the sound that just echoes back and forth across the canyon walls. I mean, it's such an amazing landscape. So those two parts of my life were pretty much separate and parallel. But one day, after actually a pretty highly technical day of discussions about the role of clouds and climate models, um, you know, I decided to head up to one of my favorite places, which is way up at the top of Independence Pass. And it's a mountain ridge that sits up above the ghost mining town of Independence, Colorado. And I think there's something powerful about a ghost mining town named Independence. <laughs> so I'm sitting up there, just enjoying the sunshine, sitting on the tundra, uh, just looking at this incredible assemblage of these tiny little plants. They're so strong, they're so hardy, and yet they're so incredibly fragile, uh, and they're so old. Um, and I let my gaze just kind of wander, and suddenly I had one of those complete gestalt shifts, where I suddenly saw all the patches of tundra on the the various mountaintops around me. And I suddenly realized that they were islands. And as islands, I suddenly realized they were, they were going to drown. No less than the islands of Tuvalu and Vanuatu and Kiribati and the Seychelles and so on that we hear so much about with rising sea levels. These islands, these remnants of the great plains of tundra that were here after the retreat of the last ice age, these little remnants are islands no less than that, and they're going to be inundated by rising temperatures. And then I looked down below in the valley, and I saw this whole assemblage of species that I'd come to love, the trees and the fish and the animals. And I realized that many of them are not going to be here either. They can't move. How do you move 10 miles a year, especially when you have to travel over mountains? And then my eye kept going down the valley, and I saw Aspen twinkling down below. <clears throat> and I imagined these giant mansions scattered over the hillsides, 
sitting empty except for two weeks a year right around Christmas time. And the Range Rover 4x4s filling the town that had never tasted dirt. <coughs> and the finest, freshest sushi at 8,000 feet and more than 1,000 miles from an ocean. And again, in this kind of sudden flash, I suddenly saw in my mind's eye this a giant plume, a like mushroom cloud of carbon dioxide billowing out of this town and up into the sky. And then I saw another cloud emerging out of basalt, and another one out of Carbondale, and another one out of Glenwood Springs, and off in the distance, a huge one coming out of Las Vegas, and Phoenix, and Los Angeles, and suddenly I realized it was everywhere. And so suddenly I really got it. I really felt like I understood global climate change, I understood the scale, the scope, the consequences of this problem for the first time. And this vision, this daydream, this daydream, has saddened me, frightened me, sickened me, and inspired me ever since. I've carried this vision into each of the landscapes and places I love most. Um, the forests and rocky shorelines of Oregon, the gentle farmland of mid-Michigan, and in some ways the most powerfully in the wild landscapes of Alaska, where the early signs can already be read, the drunken trees falling into the melting permafrost, the salmon streams already beyond critical temperature thresholds, the white spruce forests of the Kenai Peninsula that have been eaten alive from the inside out by the spruce budworm, which now cycles through two or even three complete life cycles in a single summer, and in the voices and lived experiences of my friends among the Inupiaq in Northern Alaska. And so all of this has made me realize I'm experiencing a very, and we talked, you talked about loss and grief yesterday. Well, this is a peculiar sense of loss, not the loss of something in the past. This isn't some, a loss of a loved one or a loss of something I once owned. This global environmental change is haunted by a sense of future loss, what's to come. And as I was thinking about this yesterday, I realized there's only one other analogy in my life and that's my father, because my dad is 80. He has emphysema. He's had it for 10 years. He's doing okay. You know, he gets around, he's, he's doing all right. But I can hear the death rattle in his throat. I can hear the labored wheeze as he inhales and exhales the breath of life. And I know that I don't have him for much longer. So finally, to come back to the story and finish, finally I brought my vision back across the west, up the Roaring Fort Valley, past Aspen, and then the ghost town of Independence again, back, back, back to the tundra under my feet. I turned around, I walked back down the mountain, and I went back to work. That's it. <laughs> It was, uh, it felt like a long afternoon and evening yesterday. There was just so much stuff in it. And uh, it's so incredibly stimulating. Uh, I often think of things in a hermetic sense. I, I, I felt like one of, those, one of those butterflies going from flower to flower with each presentation, just trying to soak up as much nectar as I could. Because I think that that's what's being uh, presented here, we, we have 20 minutes to present something and, and we're really trying to convey, each of us, something that is, is of essence to us. And then to be able to hear and even feel, like Tony just presented, the, the essences of each other, it's very stimulating. And in fairy tales, it's about going to the festival. You think of the, the trend, a transformative moment in Cinderella is when her father went off to the festival. And uh, just like the festivals of old, I mean, people came in from all around and there were some mysterious and magical things, kind of like David's talk last night, and uh, all sorts of interchange. And that's, that's what's happening here. It's like a big intellectual and, and sensual festival. Uh, one of the uh, thoughts that, that uh, struck me, though, 
uh, was, um, I, I, I think Susie made some comment about, you know, what, how can we apply this? And how is this relevant? <coughs> and I, I think there are two different streams going on here. I think it's important for us to, to think of how something can be made more immediately relevant and what images we can feed the, the politicians or uh, other groups and so on. Uh, that's that's one dimension, but there's another broader dimension. Yes. <laughs> there's another. <laughs> okay. Everyone wants a voice in this. Video. I guess so. <laughs> it's a variation of your gorilla. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that butterfly that flew in yesterday. Um, there's another broader dimension, which uh, is equally important. And it, it's, it's something, it's a little bit like uh, basic research versus applied research. And the, the basic research stuff is that we're all in the process of uh, kind of out of grief for the environment and, and, and for what is happening. Uh, it's like the old kings in our culture and in our psyches, in our ways that we grew up and perceive the world. They're dying off, and there's some sadness about that. There's some sadness about what's happening. So we're, we're reformulating things, and, and we've all developed things to a certain degree. And, and we're here to talk about what we've developed and hear what other people have developed. But this is kind of philosophical, you know, it's, it's broad, big perspectives. And uh, that is just as important as the, the more immediate attempt to, to have a, uh, applied things that we can use more quickly. Uh, I was uh, very uh, touched by Robert's uh, presentation yesterday. I like this idea of psyche reminding us about what we have forgotten. Reminding us and to remember. When I think of remember, uh, I, I think of becoming a member or seeing ourselves again as members of broader communities, as members of global citizens, as members of our biospheres. Uh, I love that story about uh, Frankenstein as a model for what's happening and that the attempt there was to create something that would never die. As I understand it, the uh, the death and rebirth cycles were very much connected with the uh, the mother goddess cults. And one of the ways of looking at the Oedipal myth is that uh, uh, Oedipus, in answering the Sphinx, answered that it was man that uh, went through these various stages. But the appropriate answer was the Sphinx. The Sphinx was the, the one of the great images of the, the ancient world and the goddess of life and faith and death and rebirth. So. This, that's when, in our Western culture, in a way, this, this emphasis on being clever, what somebody called being a clever moron, we're very smart and intelligent, but we somehow or another miss this broad, deep, big picture, and that, in some ways, is encapsulated by the Sphinx. Um, and then Robert talked about uh, grief, and I think of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and what's that for? You know, so the Tibetans are there, they're, they're helping the person after that person died to go through the various, I uh, uh, forget what they're called, various levels of enlightenment or disenlightenment. But equally important to the Tibetans is what that's doing for the individual. It makes them think about their death. Plato said, philosophy is dying before your physical death. You know, what does that mean? Before your, chronicle, before your chronological death, you die psychically. So we have to die and be reborn, and, and that's what's happening now on the planet, and that's what's uh, beginning to happen in, in many of us. So grief then becomes a very necessary part of that transformation. And uh, also the comment that the earth is where we bury the dead. When we did our Spirit in the Land, and I have a video, I remember I have a videotape of Francis Hall doing this, but we had this wonderful soil scientist named Francis Hall. Now, what better last name could you have for a soil scientist? <laughs> uh, uh, Francis had uh, been teaching for many years, and toward the past last several years of his life, 
he would come into his graduate student classes on soil science and play some violin music. It's kind of like Jack Benny, but violin music <laughs> about the soil. He was so passionate about that. And he would have the kids uh, uh, make things with, with earthworm cast. They would collect earthworm cast and then make little designs with it and stuff. <laughs> and Francis said, we are all TNS. We are all temporarily not soil. <laughs> the earth is, is not only the realm of the dead, but for a microbiologist, it's incredibly alive. It's full of nematodes. It's full of all sorts of little insects and protozoans and stuff like that. And that's why it's such a rich smell. Uh, Jung said it was, and this relates to uh, Jeff's dream, those primates, uh, fingers in there. Jung said it was important for city dwellers to have a plot of land to work so the primate within us could come forth. Now when he talked about the two million year old man within, do you know how far back that goes? That's well before humans. I don't know if that's even before Lucy. And he was pretty well aware of evolutionary theory. So this is part, this is our, our most na natural part, I think what David was talking about, that responds like an animal to the world. And it's that level, that's what one of the levels, when you talk about archetypes, we're just talking about basic things that can even be things like basic chemical processes. But when you're talking two million year old man and woman, you're talking about relating to the earth well before this big cortex and the cortex was developed. <coughs> uh, and also then getting uh, just a bit about science. Uh, science, it is science that gave us this new image of wholeness. The earth rise from the moon. You know, science gave us that image. It's incredible, uh, incredibly sophisticated technology. And while, while I'm on the science thing, uh, David is just a masterful presentation, like, like somebody said earlier, of, of giving us the spell of the sensuous. Uh, that I associated more with the, uh, the hermetic side of things, uh, flighting, uh, kind of flighting in the body, physical and so on. But the Apollonic side is equally beautiful. I think, I, I, I think uh, that scientists in a way can appreciate the world more than anybody else. I had to teach, I had to teach to survive, yes. Uh, advanced placement biology while I was training at the Jung Institute to make some money to support myself. <laughs> And uh, at that level, I really came to appreciate this incredible sophistication for, for a chlorophyll molecule to uh, uh, capture a photon, which has no mass, and then for that the series of, of molecules that have to be in the proper sequence, but each one very complex, to, to be able to transfer that energy down to till some chemical bond is made it's just uh, an incredibly sophisticated and complex thing. It's, it's an intellectual concept in some way, but it's, there's a beauty in that. And, and like I say, only a scientist who can appreciate that level of complexity is, can be in totally in awe in that domain. The challenge is to be in that domain as well as this central side. Remember, uh, Zeus said Apollo and Hermes were to love each other. It's not one or the other, it's the imbalance that creates the difficulty. Um, I thought Andrew and Carolyn and Norm uh, gave us uh, a lot of hope. And then this New York Times, number one bestseller now, <laughs> Al Gore's book. Uh, uh -huh. uh, there, there, is, there is some real hope and, and uh, we all, I have to speak for myself. I, I've, I spent a lot of time working on union eco-psychology and putting you know, all these things together. And I haven't been able to keep up on all these other dimensions. But there are just so many things that I've heard. Oh, yeah, this is happening. This is exciting and, and so on. So I, I, I'm just soaking, soaking this, uh, this type of information up. Um, and then the comment about Aristotle. I love that idea of a citizen. <coughs> Uh, is somebody with a duty towards others and a commitment to the common good and active participation in public affairs. That reminds me of a dream that uh, Hillman presented in uh, one of his articles dear to my heart called Going Bucks. 
Uh, when I got to the Jung Institute in Zurich, uh, Hillman loved to play, play, play baseball. He was married to uh, Pat, Barry. Pat Barry at the time, who was a, a softball star at Ohio State. So every 4th of July, <laughs> Hillman would find a place in Zurich where we could have a softball game. And we're riding up to the uh, this softball field on the 4th of July, and he was he was trying to encourage me to do my thesis in, in Zurich on insects. But I was trying to get as far away from entomology as I could at the time. But anyway, I didn't know he'd been collecting dreams of insects and animals for years. And in, in his article, Going Bugs, he talked about a woman who was confronted by a big praying mantis. And she asked, uh, the mantis asked the woman, are you a citizen? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Hillman worked with that, and if you put it in the gestalt, okay, here's somebody from a very low, uh, somebody, <laughs> subjective, okay, an animal from uh, evolutionary-wise, very primitive, uh, and it's asking, are you a citizen? About the only way you can take that, because this is very much related to David's, David's talk, insects are so totally plugged into the world of the sensuous sense of smell they've got taste buds in their feet you know they've got ears in their legs uh, they've got they can pick up on one a cecropia male can pick up the molecule of, of just one molecule of female moth I don't know how many miles away it's phenomenal okay so um, <laughs> one has to admire that <laughs> so um, that worked both ways <laughs> that's true uh, so I think Hillman's point was are you a citizen of the biosphere you know are you a citizen of the organic world that you that we're all a part of uh, one of the people that I've taken a great deal of ins inspiration from and with regard to many different groups working together and all contributing, is Phil Lewis in Wisconsin. And if you're not familiar with his work, uh, of The Future by Design, he's somebody that Gaylord Nelson, when he was governor, raised the, the cigarette tax a penny a pack and hired Phil Lewis to come in and assess the whole state of Wisconsin. And so he developed ways of assessing what aesthetic beauty is. There's a certain grade of a hill or a hill in relationship to water that every human being finds attractive. There's more attraction in a forest with some clearings than a solid forest. This, this can all be measured. And he assessed the whole state of Wisconsin like that, and as a consequence came up with the Circle City idea, that you have your people concentrated in the cities, and you keep your farmlands and your, uh, your uh, parks and stuff open, and then you have good transportation, uh, light rail and so on between the cities. Instead of having these mech houses, you know, scattered out throughout the landscape and suburbs just creeping out and out. When we flew into Bavaria a couple years ago and we were coming down, I could see it. All the houses are clustered in the cities and then they're surrounded by farmland. There aren't just, you know, these big ostentatious houses scattered everywhere. The Germans have kept those cities those villages bunched together. Okay, just a couple of more comments. Oh, is it 15 minutes? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, good, I'll stop. <laughs>